Hi, this is Tom from ZeroToFinals.com. In this video, I'm going to be going through arrhythmias. And you can find written notes on this topic at ZeroToFinals.com slash arrhythmias or in the cardiology section of the Zero to Finals medicine book. And you can find flashcards and questions to train your knowledge and help you remember the information for longer at members.zerotofinals.com. So let's jump straight in. Arrhythmias are abnormal heart rhythms. They result from an interruption to the normal electrical signals that coordinate the contraction of the heart muscle. There are several types of arrhythmias, each with different causes and different management options. This section is a summary to help with your exam preparation and is based on the guidelines from the Resuscitation Council UK from 2021. Attend the relevant courses, follow full guidelines and involve experienced seniors when you're treating patients. Let's start by talking about the cardiac arrest rhythms. There are four possible rhythms that can occur in a pulseless patient. These rhythms are either shockable, meaning that defibrillation may be effective, or non-shockable, meaning that defibrillation will not be effective. The shockable rhythms are ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation. The two non-shockable rhythms are asystole, which is where there's no significant electrical activity, or pulseless electrical activity which is all electrical activity except ventricular fibrillation or ventricular tachycardia. And this includes if the patient has sinus rhythm but no pulse. Next let's talk about narrow complex tachycardia. Narrow complex tachycardia refers to a fast heart rate with a QRS complex duration of less than 0.12 seconds. On a normal 25 mm per second ECG, 0.12 seconds equals 3 small squares. Therefore, the QRS complex will fit within 3 small squares in a narrow complex tachycardia. There are four main differentials of a narrow complex tachycardia. Sinus tachycardia, and the treatment of this focuses on the underlying cause. Supraventricular tachycardia, which is treated with vagal maneuvers and adenosine. Atrial fibrillation, which is treated with rate control or rhythm control. And atrial flutter, which is treated with rate control or rhythm control, similar to atrial fibrillation. And we'll talk in more detail about atrial flutter later. Patients with a narrow complex tachycardia with life-threatening features such as loss of consciousness or syncope, heart muscle ischemia for example with chest pain, shock or severe heart failure are treated with synchronized DC cardioversion under sedation or a general anesthetic. Intravenous amiodarone is added if the initial DC shocks are unsuccessful. Next let's talk about broad complex tachycardia. Broad complex tachycardia refers to a fast heart rate with a QRS complex duration of more than 0.12 seconds or three small squares on an ECG. The resuscitation guidelines break down broad complex tachycardia into four main groups. Ventricular tachycardia or unknown cause which is treated with IV amiodarone polymorphic ventricular tachycardia such as Tossard de Poins, which is treated with IV magnesium, atrial fibrillation with a bundle branch block which is treated as atrial fibrillation and supraventricular tachycardia with a bundle branch block and this is treated as supraventricular tachycardia. Patients with life-threatening features should be treated with synchronized DC cardioversion under sedation or a general anesthetic and intravenous amiodarone is added if the initial DC shocks are unsuccessful. Let's talk in more detail about atrial flutter. 
Normally, the electrical signal passes through the atria once, stimulating a contraction, then it disappears through the atrioventricular node into the ventricles. Atrial flutter is caused by a re-entrant rhythm in either atrium. The electrical signal recirculates in a self-perpetuating loop due to an extra electrical pathway in the atria. The signal goes round and round in the atria without interruption, causing an atrial rate of around 300 beats per minute. The signal does not usually enter the ventricles on every lap due to the long refractory period of the atrioventricular node. This often results in two atrial contractions for every one ventricular contraction, which is 2 to 1 conduction through the atrioventricular node, and this gives a ventricular rate of 150 beats per minute. There may be 3 to 1, 4 to 1 or variable conduction ratios. Atrial flutter gives a sore tooth appearance on an ECG, describing a similar appearance to the cutting edge of a handsaw with repeated P waves occurring at around 300 per minute with a narrow complex tachycardia. Treatment of atrial flutter is similar to atrial fibrillation, including anticoagulation to reduce the risk of stroke based on the CHADS VAS score. Radiofrequency ablation of the re entrant rhythm can be a permanent solution. Let's talk about prolonged QT interval. The QT interval is from the start of the QRS complex to the end of the T wave. The corrected QT interval, or QTC, estimates the QT interval if the heart rate were 60 beats per minute. And this is prolonged at more than 440 milliseconds in men, or 460 milliseconds in women. A prolonged QT interval represents prolonged repolarization of the heart muscle cells, or myocytes, after a contraction. Depolarization is the electrical process that leads to heart contraction. Repolarization is the recovery period before the muscle cells are ready to depolarize again. Waiting a long time for repolarization, which is what happens with a prolonged QT interval, can result in spontaneous depolarization in some of the muscle cells. These abnormal spontaneous depolarizations that occur before repolarization are known as after depolarizations. These after depolarizations spread throughout the ventricles, causing a contraction before proper repolarization. When this leads to recurrent contractions without normal repolarization, it's called torsade de points. Torsade de points is a type of polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. It translates from French as twisting of the spikes, describing the ECG characteristics. On an ECG, it looks like standard ventricular tachycardia, but with the appearance that the QRS complex is twisting around the baseline. The height of the QRS complexes gets progressively smaller, then larger, then smaller, and so on. Dossard de points will terminate spontaneously and revert back to sinus rhythm, or it will progress to ventricular tachycardia, and ventricular tachycardia can lead to cardiac arrest. The causes of a prolonged QT interval include long QT syndrome, which is an inherited condition, medications such as antipsychotics, citalopram, flecainide, sotalol, amiodrone, and macrolide antibiotics, and electrolyte imbalances such as hypokalemia, or a low potassium, hypomagnesemia, or a low magnesium, and hypocalcemia, or a low calcium. Management of a prolonged QT interval involves stopping and avoiding medications that prolong the QT interval, correcting electrolyte disturbances, 
using beta blockers but not sotalol and pacemakers or implantable cardioverter defibrillators. Acute management of torsade de points involves correcting the underlying cause, for example electrolyte disturbances or medications, a magnesium infusion, even if they have a normal magnesium, and defibrillation if ventricular tachycardia occurs. Next let's talk about ventricular ectopics. Ventricular ectopics are premature ventricular beats caused by random electrical discharges outside the atria. Patients often present complaining of random extra or missed beats. They're relatively common at all ages and in healthy patients. However, they're more common in patients who have pre-existing heart conditions, for example ischemic heart disease or heart failure. Ventricular ectopics appear as isolated, random, abnormal, broad QRS complexes on an otherwise normal ECG. Bigeminy refers to when every other beat is a ventricular ectopic. The ECG shows a normal beat with a P wave, QRS complex, and T wave, followed immediately by an ectopic beat, then a normal beat, then an ectopic, and so on. Management involves reassurance and no treatment in otherwise healthy people with infrequent ectopics, seeking specialist advice in patients with underlying heart disease, frequent or concerning symptoms, for example chest pain or syncope, or a family history of heart disease or sudden death, and beta blockers are sometimes used to help manage the symptoms. Next let's talk about heart block. First degree heart block occurs when there's delayed conduction through the atrioventricular node. Despite this delayed conduction, every atrial impulse leads to a ventricular contraction, meaning that on the ECG, every P wave is followed by a QRS complex. On an ECG, first degree heart block presents as a PR interval greater than 0.2 seconds which is five small squares or one big square. Second degree heart block is where some atrial impulses do not make it through the atrial ventricular node to the ventricles. There are instances where P waves are not followed by QRS complexes. There are two types of second degree heart block. Mobitz type one, which is Wenckebach's phenomenon, and Mobitz type 2. Mobitz type 1, or Wenckebach's phenomenon, is where the conduction through the atrioventricular node takes progressively longer until finally it fails, after which it resets and the cycle restarts. So on an ECG, there's an increasing PR interval until a P wave is not followed by a QRS complex. The PR interval then returns to normal and the cycle repeats itself. Mobitz type 2 is where there's intermittent failure of conduction through the atrioventricular node with an absence of QRS complexes following P waves. There's usually a set ratio of P waves to QRS complexes, for example 3 P waves for each QRS complex, which is a 3 to 1 block. The PR interval remains normal in Mobitz type 2. There's a risk of asystole with Mobitz type 2. In a patient with a 2 to 1 block, where there are two P waves for each QRS complex, meaning that every other P wave does not stimulate a QRS complex, it can be difficult to tell whether this is caused by Mobitz type 1 or Mobitz type 2. Third degree heart block is also called complete heart block and this is where there's no observable relationship between the P waves and the QRS complexes and there's a significant risk of asystole with third degree heart block. Finally let's talk about bradycardias. Bradycardia refers to a slow heart rate typically less than 60 beats per minute. A heart rate under 60 can be normal in fit healthy patients 
without causing any symptoms. There's a long list of causes of bradycardia, including medications such as beta blockers, heart block and sick sinus syndrome. Sick sinus syndrome encompasses many conditions that cause dysfunction in the sinoatrial node or the natural pacemaker in the heart. It's often caused by idiopathic degenerative fibrosis of the sinoatrial node, meaning that without a specific cause, the sinoatrial node degenerates into scar tissue. Sick sinus syndrome can result in sinus bradycardia, sinus arrhythmias and prolonged pauses between beats. Asystole refers to the absence of electrical activity in the heart and this results in cardiac arrest. There's a risk of asystole in Mobitz type 2, third degree heart block or complete heart block, previous asystole and ventricular pauses longer than 3 seconds, meaning 3 seconds between beats. Management of unstable patients and those at risk of asystole involves intravenous atropine, first line, inotropes, for example isoprenaline or adrenaline, temporary cardiac pacing and a permanent implantable pacemaker when available. The options for temporary cardiac pacing are transcutaneous pacing using pads on the patient's chest and transvenous pacing using a catheter fed through the venous system to stimulate the heart directly. Atropine, which is the medication used to treat bradycardia, increases the heart rate by acting as an anti-muscarinic medication, inhibiting the parasympathetic nervous system. Inhibiting the parasympathetic nervous system leads to side effects of pupil dilation, dry mouth, urinary retention and constipation. Research has consistently shown that testing yourself after learning a topic has a powerful effect on how long you retain that information. This is known as the testing effect. Studying and then testing yourself results in longer lasting and stronger recall on that information when tested at a later date, even when compared with additional study sessions. If you're preparing for a medical exam and you're not regularly testing your knowledge and practicing your recall, you're failing to maximize your potential. The Zero to Finals member site contains flashcards, short answer questions, multiple choice questions, and extended matching questions that are purpose built to supplement the Zero to Finals content, helping you build your internal database of knowledge and take advantage of the powerful testing effect. If you like the Zero to Finals notes, books, videos and podcasts, then you'll love the members' site.